wrote an interesting, a super interesting article uh, a few weeks ago uh, comparing all the headsets on the market, and you saw maybe him also there on the uh, pod. Well, they are working in this specific field since always, yeah. yeah, more or less, and so I'm really glad to have him here. Uh, Alex Coulomb, thank you. Thank you. I love you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep this casual. I had like a more professional kind of demeanor prepared, but this is fine, so we'll keep it going. Um, yeah, so my name is Alex Coulomb. I'm from New York City, and this is what we're going to talk about today. And uh, before I talk, though, I want you guys to think back to a very long time ago, a very long time ago. Um, Keely gave this fantastic presentation that I really appreciated because her discussion of phenomenology is a big part of what I'm going to be talking about today. And I was struggling with how to just give a brief introduction to it, how to phrase it. And now I was just able to delete a few slides and say, like, remember Keely's presentation? Wasn't that elegant? Wasn't that nice? Um, and now just bear that in mind as we go through mine. And if you want to think of this as kind of an elemental thing, I call uh, Keely's presentation like a water element or a water type. And I'm going to be this kind of crazy fire that's shooting off in all directions and destroying everything. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> And uh, Agile and Lewis of Design is a extremely small operation based out of New York City. Uh, I grew out of the previous architecture firm I was working for called Fisher Dax Associates, theater planning and design. So for a few years, I was designing exclusively um, theaters, which was a ton of fun because I also really like acting and the whole world of theater. Um, and I worked for previous architects like Raphael Bagnoli and a few other firms around New York City, and I liked it. But the reason I got really sucked into the world of VR was because it was so cutting edge and everything was changing and it really went with my kind of manic brain well to constantly feel like I needed to stay on top of things. And so uh, I really realized I took a strong interest in trying to keep up with everything and finding out the best ways to apply these new devices and techniques to help my architectural brethren who so often are feeling overwhelmed and like deadlines are approaching and even if you tell them, hey, there's this one thing you could change in your workflow, they're like, please go away, I just want to go to sleep. Um, so, you know, their, their time is very short, so you're going to be explaining to them, here's a headset you should buy, here's a new technique you should have, here's an experience I'm going to build for you, it better be something that's really going to make your life better. And uh, one thing we end up doing quite a bit is uh, building charts that just help people understand what the technology is, where it's coming from. Um, the article that uh, Fabio mentioned had, you know, this chart kind of just giving a breakdown of different headsets. So I try to stay very knowledgeable and on top of not only all these new devices and software and techniques, but the best way for them to be used for um, our industry. And I'm kind of in between the art is and the um, architecture side because I'm kind of designing these phenomenological you know, VR experiences where it's, they're very custom and we have to be very specific about what we're trying to show. And so I've been using VR since the Oculus Rift DK1. If you see the timestamp at the bottom, you actually can't, it's uh, late 2013. And uh, we went through you know, the DK1, the DK2, just very early stuff. We're trying to figure out how to lean and, and check sight lines in theaters. And uh, that was very useful. And I learned some important lessons about you know, not showing too much too early if the project is still in SD and you're making everything photo real with tons of lighting and everything, it's going to overwhelm a lot of people, it's going to confuse them, it's going to make the discussion uh, about the state of the design something it shouldn't be in. And so we found that over the past few years, especially with the formation of Agile Lens Immersive Design, um, that we are building experiences and consulting at all different stages of the architectural design process, uh, being intimately familiar with it ourselves, and so, you know, every one of these bullet points here could be an hour-long talk, but we're not going to do that. So I kind of like to boil these things down into something fitting of uh, where I am. And so, you know, when I have 45 minutes to talk, I usually uh, cover these kind of three general areas. And so we're going to cut one of those out and just focus on these two. The quick review stuff would be um, drag and drop, one click kind of VR platform solutions, the kind of stuff I'd be recommending to people when I don't want them to be hiring me if I'm saying like, hey, actually there's a piece of software that does what you want very well if all you want to do is walk around the building, you know, inside VR, RS VR, that kind of stuff. And so building a custom experience, and again, I want you bearing in mind this kind of phenomenological idea of when you're inside a VR experience, there's an opportunity there to really understand the space, both what the space 
the current state of the space as well as what the space can become. And it's different if you're designing a VR experience for a group of designers who are actually actively working on the space versus a client or a potential user of the space. Those all have different goals, and the VR experience built needs to accordingly um, you know, reach those goals. And so I was at the, the Biennale the other day, and you know, a lot of beautiful pieces, but I've spent so much time in VR now these days that I have trouble uh, really appreciating you know, little scalies and uh, these beautifully crafted, wonderful models now that don't let me get inside them. Um, it, it feels a little bit detached now, you know, for the, it might be a beautiful sculptural object, some of these you can see uh, a design in the context of the city, and those certainly still have value, but the experiences that really got to me at the Biennale this year were the ones where you actually were at a human scale or something close to human scale, and, you know, they almost have like a playground quality where you can get inside them and actually just really feel like, you know, there's something going on there that's nice. So a lot of these were doing things with mirrors that, you know, for those of you who've been in spaces that use mirrors well, can help open up the space, make it feel brighter, make it feel larger. And I think about this kind of stuff when I'm building a VR experience. You know, what should that experience be um, and why? What are the goals that you're trying to accomplish? Because a lot of people, it reminds me a lot of what happened um, with Toy Story when Toy Story came out, right? So everyone was like, oh, Toy Story was successful because it's a 3D movie. And, you know, for those of you who have seen Toy Story, you're probably thinking, no, Toy Story had a great story. And if it was a 2D animated movie that was done exactly the same way, I still think it would be a classic film. But people took that lesson of like, oh, I see, we just need to make 3D movies now. And that's been really unfortunate because of the downturn of, you know, more 2D animation. And that's a different talk. But I think the same thing has happened with VR, where people are like, oh, we just do VR, and then magically everything's amazing. And that isn't the case, you know. There's a lot of cases where traditional mediums of representation are still the best ones, and um, VR should be handled carefully, especially because a bad VR experience can make someone not want to try VR again for a very long time. But when you are crafting a VR experience, you know, I, I tend to show these slides to help people understand that it's not as intimidating of a process to start to get uh, started with this kind of stuff as you might think. If you're already dealing with archives, if you're already creating your own renders, if you're modeling and lighting and texturing things, then you know you might already know this. You're actually not too far away from being able to go from a flat panorama to something that's uh, 360. Or then again, this goes back to kind of one-click solutions. But there are very simple ways to get started with making tours. Uh, Peter very simply talking about uh, the viewer, which is a great kind of drag and drop platform for that. And then again, there's a lot of one-click solutions that will let you navigate a space. But those need to be carefully designed experiences, even if you're not going into the deep customization that I'm often doing, where everything needs to be, you know, this is going to have this level of detail, this level, this level of detail, and this will be off access, but this won't be, um, all of that. But again, once you have all that figured out, what I love about building a really highly custom VR experience is at that point, we then have access to all these other uh, platforms and traditional mediums. If you have a really nice VR model, you can make flat animations and beautiful renders, and or at least use them as a starting point because you're, A, you're already going to have a better understanding of the space, so going back to more traditional means of representation, you're going to have a better sense of what works and what doesn't. Um, and B, there, again, once you're at one level of VR, say very high-end desktop VR, you then can start to do things with web VR or turn it into something that's a little bit more akin to a traditional 2D video game experience, and that can be really fantastic. Uh, this is a slide I stole, and I like how the font is kind of running off there, from uh, a great article by a guy named uh, Vincent McCurley, Storyboarding in VR. And this very much goes in line with what um, Keely was talking about, where it's not about crafting a, a narrative in VR, it's about creating a space that allows for people to have their own narratives come to life. And so, I like some of the diagrams here, because it's just starting to walk you through the considerations that need to be made um, when you're inside a VR experience. And I was telling some people before we started, I really like the Mirage Solo camera here because it's 180. And some people say like, oh, well, that's a lot less immersive than 360. But this gives you more control over an experience that you're filming because you actually do still have a sense of framing. And if I'm in a 360 experience, especially one that isn't well guided, and this could be something filmed, and this could be something that's a digital VR experience, I often feel like I need to be spinning around, like, oh, mm, what if something really cool is happening right behind me? And that's generally a sign of poor, you know, guided tourism or something like that. 
And so just to give you, I'm going to walk through very quickly just some of the projects I've worked on just so you get a sense of the, the breadth of what the goals have been and then why VR was useful. Because many times I've been approached with a project and said, I don't think that should be VR, and I'm either you know, uh, recommending a different company to do it, or I'll just say, like, I just think you want some V-Ray renders, and maybe I can help you with that. Um, so this was an example where a company already had a bunch of renders set up, and they basically just said, hey, we just want to get this into VR as quick as possible. And so that was kind of an interesting process. And this is right around the time DataSmith was coming out, and it was part of the beta, and it was a fantastic way to take all these V-Ray renders and very quickly get them into um, virtual reality with minimal effort. You know, uh, Pierre Felix was talking earlier about being able to do things like take a very high polygon count, you know, tree proxy, uh, a V-Ray proxy from 3ds Max and replace it. You know, those are the kind of things that were hanging me up here. It was like, oh, I can't be importing these five million polygon things in here. Um, I need to do it myself. But anyway, the reason why this worked well in VR was because the goal of this experience, note that word goal, was to be able to pre-sell these units, these housing units, uh, for students at UNC down in North Carolina. And of course, the fact that the students can go to the leasing office now and walk around those spaces and get a good sense of what those would be like when this building is constructed in another couple of years is a fantastic use case for VR. Uh, oops, sorry. This is a project done for Intel, um, subcontracted under Glimpse Group, and this is a demo we have today. And uh, Intel has their new i9 that I think is out now, and they basically wanted a way to show off the power of the i9. So it was like, what can we do inside a real engine that's really going to be CPU intensive? So animations, particle effects, um, things of that nature. And I'll, I'll tell you, Intel told me to remove the fireworks, and, but here's the thing. This is going to be an open source project. Anyone is going to be able to download this soon and do whatever you want. So I figured, like, I can put the fireworks back in because when it is open source, that's what I'm going to do. Um, also, uh, as we were talking about earlier with Adama, I don't like Adama people in VR. Same, same idea, you know, they feel very uncanny valley. And so I also have a toggle in the experience you can check out in my booth where you can just turn them all into silhouettes. And I do find in VR it's, it's better to be looking at a more abstract representation. Uh, another cool thing we did with this project was made it so you could instantly create V-Ray renders from VR. So you can walk around the experience, you teleport around, and then just pick a spot and say, I wonder what a 360 render would be like from here. And, you know, it takes a few minutes depending on the power of your computer. Again, if you have an i9, a lot of cores would be very fast. But it's kind of a cool way to harness both the real-time capabilities of the real engine while still being able to say, hey, I think once we get here, I want this to actually be a slightly nicer quality render or, you know, have higher levels of reflectivity until all the real-time ray tracing happens. Um, this was a very early project for the late show with Stephen Colbert. The, the reason this was a great thing to do in VR was because they had a very tight deadline. This is with a company called Bravo Media. And uh, the Edsel the Theater, like David Letterman, had just come out. And uh, Stephen Colbert was trying to figure out how he could get this kind of effect up there. He wanted to paint the ceiling, and they told him no. Uh, so they thought maybe architectural projection could work. Excuse me. And so I created this Gear VR experience that let you very quickly move around the grid space and just aim the projectors with your head. This is before hand controllers or anything like that. So it was very a very rough and dirty way to just get a sense of like, okay, what's it like from here? Let's change the focal length. And it allowed uh, the designers who actually had to build this to figure out very quickly, we need four projectors, they need a throw distance of 73, and all that, that was figured out very fast compared to the typical workflow. Um, this is a project for uh, Seattle Rep over in Seattle, and this was about figuring out what kind of opacity they wanted on the screen. And so we did a full VR experience, we did a web VR experience with a KR panel up there, we did um, these 360 videos that can be viewed on YouTube, and these were all in the name of figuring out what it's like to actually be inside um, either the hallway or the theater and understand how much you're seeing into that room. Very important in the theater to know um, what might be distracting and what's helping to create the illusion of what's on stage. Um, now, of course, the best version of this is inside the actual VR experience because then you can lean and see how all those little subtle movements change things. This is for FX Collaborative. This was about being able to show the Statue of Liberty Museum, which won't be built for another couple of years, um, to both uh, the client as well as people who might potentially want to actually see what that intervention looks like. And then we also start to talk about uh, an area of VR which is wonderful, which is traveling for people who aren't going to be able to travel to a location in real life. So for anyone who might never get to visit the Statue of Liberty but still has some kind of emotional attachment to it, you know, this is a free VR experience that they can actually just check out and, and uh, get a sense of what that feels like, along with FX Collaborative's wonderful uh, design there. 
This is with DSR and Rockwell Group. Uh, this is you formerly called the Culture Shed, now just the Shed in the Hudson Yards in New York City. And again, very early experience, but I want you guys to see things don't always need to be photo real or super refined. This was made very quickly because we were having a lot of trouble in the Revit model understanding what was going on in the grid space, and there was equipment that needed to go there. And the equipment all needed either four feet of clearance or seven feet of clearance. So guess what we got? A four foot stick and a seven foot stick. Very quick experience to make, and it just allowed us to run around the grid up there and go, okay, it works there, check. You know, note it on the plan, we can put the thing we need there. So that's something that's just for the design team. You wouldn't show that to a client, you wouldn't show it to the public, but uh, you know, very useful. And now I just want to talk, and this is an experience I'm also showing today um, and tomorrow, and this is a, a theater that has been in VR since the very beginning in uh, 2015. And you'll note that very early on, you know, these were some very simple studies with no material, no lighting, nothing that didn't matter at that point was being shown. And so this was about spatial relationships. What's it just feel like to be in that space? Does it feel open? Does it feel claustrophobic? And then we also got to toggle between different schemes. And of course, a 2D screen doesn't do it justice, but being able to feel how the space expands and contracts to be able to just check sight lines very quickly is a very powerful way to make design decisions. And then you'll see, as this went on, um, oh, I think I skipped a slide. I did skip a slide, that's okay. Um, sorry guys, there's a whole middle section that shows like using the vibe tracker and all that, but it's fine. This has been in VR for a very long time, mm -hmm. and we went through all these different uh, levels of custom experiences for what can be done to help design that space. And now it got to the point where it's like, okay, well now we just need to get a sense of the materials. We uh, set up all the v materials in 3ds Max, brought it into Unreal Engine, now we have a, a simple VR experience we can walk around in, and then, again, right from within 3ds Max, this is using the new uh, VR to Unreal plugin, we're able to kind of output these different color options to decide what kind of palettes we think are going to look best when the thing is actually constructed. Um, this is a nice segue into talking about VR sketching, uh, which is something I'm very passionate about, as we'll see in a moment. And so this is a project that started with a sketch, and all these are panoramas. Again, sometimes you don't need an experience to walk around, and this one fixed point was enough for a while to understand what was going on. So we have our tilt brush sketch, we have a very quick light study, one material option and a final material option, and then later on the client was like, hey, can we walk around and like change stuff and move furniture around? And I said, can we please do that on an Oculus or a Vive? And they said, no, and I said, fine, and here we are. Um, so you know, to be able to do all that from a headset is pretty cool, uh, regardless of the fact that it's not the ideal environment to be doing that in. Now we're talking about sketching, okay? Um, a lot of people think that it's really hard to go from sketching in a sketchbook or trace paper um, over into VR, and it's really not. This is my two-year-old, and he's a very good VR artist. Full disclosure, he didn't make that, but he totally could in like a month. He's that good now. And the thing is that if you're already familiar with um, drawing, it's not as intimidating as you think. You know, I think sometimes about the, the suffering of architects over the years. You know, not too long ago, all architects were just drawing by hand. And CAD came along, you had to learn CAD and all the software that came along with that. And then BIM, which wasn't too long ago. And now a lot of people think like, oh, and on top of BIM, BIM, I need to learn how to design and draw in VR. And that's true to a certain extent, but the learning curve is not anywhere near what it was for these other uh, disruptions. Because when you're in VR, and you're designing, whether it's drawing or modeling or picking materials or lighting, it's a lot more like the first one. It's intuitive. You're using your hands. There's not these complex keyboard shortcuts and menus and very software-specific workflows that might be changing every year. Um, much more intuitive. And so with that in mind, um, there's another wonderful thing about VR now, which is that all these experiences are becoming more social, where you can actually be actively doing something with someone in VR. So in a situation like this, you know, you can have two people working through the very early ideas of design, one of them's in San Francisco, one of them's in New York, and just talking to each other as they're in the same space working this out. Again, a lot of times face-to-face -face is still ideal, but sometimes you can save the airfare and do all this inside virtual reality. So then I want you to think about these kinds of workflows. So for example, say you have a Revit model, say it's already gone through a certain level of design, but you are at a point where you would typically be doing trace paper or redlining and starting to 
change certain elements of it or developing it further. So one way, of course, to do that is with a sketchbook, classic, uh, very wonderful way to work through a design idea. Um, but then there's also this idea now that you could take that model and go inside virtual reality and start to move it around more, and then you have something that's both going to help you work through the design, all the while thinking about that human experience, the phenomenological um, side of it, as well as something that's going to be easier to communicate your design intent to anyone who needs to know, client, owner, other collaborators. And so here, this is just a very simple experience where I took this 3D Revit model, grabbed a section box, um, popped into Tilt Brush. One nice thing about Tilt Brush is it remembers every stroke you did and in the order you did it in. And so you can actually recreate everything very fast, which is kind of fun. Oh, a cool way to show someone your recreation of an idea. And you'll notice this isn't meant to be precise. I'm not snapping to vertexes or anything like that. This is about a gesture, about an idea. Because then what you can do, once you're done with this and you've worked out a certain level of what that design wants to be, you can then take it into, for example, uh, oh, I skipped the slide again. Sorry guys, we're just hopping over a couple of steps and all this. But um, the middle part was taking it into Unreal Engine and um, modeling some things, doing light, doing materials. I don't know where these slides went. But then this is kind of the point of it all, is once you've worked out the design in a very creative and free-flowing way in, uh, in you know, a program like that, you can then take it back into something like 3ds Max or Revit and then make it more precise. If you actually know what the code requirements are and you want to make sure the doors aren't too wide or anything like that, you basically can have those sketches or, or 3D geometry that you made serving as placeholders as you make the more refined version. So I find that's a pretty cool workflow. And so again, just to recap, <laughs> we missed this step, but being able to go from, you know, your modeling software into some kind of VR sketching or modeling software into um, a game engine if you want to take that extra step and be looking at realistic materials and lighting and moving that stuff around, then back over your modeling software and then rinse and repeat. When, out, when applicable, it's a really wonderful way to work. And so kind of the way I try to get people to think about this is, you know, anytime you would be using a sketchbook or a trace paper, uh, think about drawing it or modeling it in VR. And it shouldn't be something time intensive. People say, well, it's ridiculous to design a model in VR because it's exhausting or, um, you know, I can't be precise. And that's not the point. Like, first of all, you can sit down. You actually can sit down while designing in VR. And it's very comfortable and you won't get too tired that way. But also, I generally tell people, try to do everything you need to do within, like, five to 10 minutes. Like, again, don't worry about it too much at that point. You're just trying to work through an idea. You're just trying to get something to the next stage. And then here's a little chart. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture of it, or I'm happy to send it to you, or I'll give you this presentation, anything of that. But I, I do these kinds of things every so often. I, I can't promise that all this is super up to date, all the software is constantly changing. But when someone asks me, yeah, hey, is there a program that I can both draw and sculpt in that also has a multi-user component, then yeah, I say, okay, well, yeah, you can get Masterpiece. And as you see here, like these aren't expensive programs. It's not like the Autodesk suite or anything like that. And the VR headsets are now at a point where $200, you can have something that will let you use this stuff. So it's not a huge investment. It's not a huge ask if you're in a position in your company where you need to say, hey, can we spend $200? Um, so, proof of concept. Uh, this is a design that I came up with um, commuting in New York City along the Hudson River. There's a very beautiful spot that I like to look at. And I was imagining you know, what it would be like to have a little design intervention there. And so I hopped to the tilt brush with that sight still fresh in my mind and started to sketch out an idea. My goal with this was to spend as much time in VR as possible working through this idea um, and actually by being in VR, being very aware of the human experience of it. So I was adjusting door widths and ceiling heights and the shapes of everything based on what felt right. Um, all from within VR, which was a very cool way to work. And then was able to generate, you know, different material options, different architectural choices. What if we move the fire to the center? Hearth is the center of the house, that kind of thing. And um, then from there, was able to have something that, again, you, you all can see this, and uh, some of you already have, it's been a lot of fun. And speaking again, by the way, about some of the, the playfulness uh, that can come with a phenomenological experience, that word is so fun to say. One thing I find really interesting watching people go in this experience is some people, get really excited when something's interactive, like a plate of apples. But then if they drop something or knock something over, you learn a lot about someone, they might feel like they need to pick it up and put it just so back where it was. Or people just like to wreak havoc and they're like, this is amazing, and then they just drop the headset and kick it and run away. 
And you know, you learn a lot about what someone does in a space where there aren't really consequences. You know, in VR we can resell all this in a second and it's fine. But you know, I remember the, the guys who made Job Simulator talking about how a lot of people when they're making a, a meal, they would open the fridge, take out their ingredients, and close the fridge because you don't want to waste all that electricity and you know, coldness. So I, I find that stuff utterly fascinating. And then just going back to my earlier point about how you get um, different experiences out. So this one experience, there's a purely sketch-related version. You can see Tilt Rush. There's a Daydream experience. There's a KR Panel experience, as well as a, a the viewer experience. And then, of course, the desktop experience. So once you've done the work of one version of that kind of thing, you can do a lot more. So now we go just wrapping up a little bit about the phenomenological stuff. Because um, a lot of times when people see the Cliffside Pavilion, the, the question is, oh, well, is that project going to be built? And I say, absolutely no way. And they say, well, then, Alex, that was a waste of time. And I say, first of all, you're very mean. Please don't be my friend anymore. And then I say that, no, actually, there is a lot of value in something like that. Because what I'm finding, especially over the past few years, is that people are spending more time in virtual reality. Iris VR uh, has some stats lately that like the average gamer spends something like three hours in a video game in VR, um, and the average AEC firm that's using VR spends like six hours a week in it, which is pretty nice. And so you imagine in the professional capacity, in the personal capacity, these, aren't, these technologies aren't going away. We're not quite at the Ready Player One level yet, and it might be some time, but there's clearly value in what can be done when you don't need to commute through heavy traffic or travel to the other side of the world to see someone. There's a lot of opportunities where that just makes sense. The problem with a lot of VR experiences right now is, phenomenologically, they're atrocious to exist in. They are not pleasant experiences. And so something I'm constantly begging all of my friends to do, who are very talented architects and designers, is to start thinking about what the opportunities are inside VR to craft spaces that could only exist in VR and are doing that version of that typology perfectly in VR in a way that's very different from the real world. Because even the experiences that work really well in VR right now, in many cases, they're a simple emulation of the real world version. I don't know if anyone checked out the Oculus Venue stuff that's been going on the past couple days, but it's like being in a stadium with a bunch of random people. And this is a whole other discussion, but like, I wonder if you're going to have a giant crowd of people watching a virtual game or concert inside VR, should it really be exactly like what the real version of that experience is, complete with people talking too loud right over your ear, and that kind of stuff. Uh, big Screen VR is a great example of screen sharing, again, the way that work is starting to move to the point where you can have multiple people interacting, looking at each other's screen, changing things. Um, thinking about some of the architects of the past and the theoreticians who designed spaces that were never intended to be built. This is the scene of Taffer Newton by Belay in 1728, and yeah, he wasn't thinking this was going to be a built project, but now in virtual reality, that can exist. And so some of these things that were meant to inspire and provoke a sense of wonder, they can exist and might lead to A, better real projects that are built, but also better virtual reality experiences that people are going to be spending a lot of time in. Ready Player One, I like the dance club that everyone gets to dance around in the air, and I think that's a nice use of the way physics aren't constrained in VR. And so, you know, quick example of this, this is my thesis from architecture school up at Syracuse University. And we did a, a rough calculation towards the end of my thesis that this conversion of, of Fort J on Governor's Island into this crazy stadium full of cameras and, you know, some early use of augmented reality and all that would have been approximately $1.8 billion to construct. And so, of course, I wasn't thinking that was actually going to happen. It involved everyone getting in a submarine and traveling from South Ferry and coming up through the center um, and then having this panopticon kind of view of all the stages around them. And yeah, no way that would exist in the real world, but hey, guess what? I can do this in VR right now, and I kind of am. Um, I'm working with High Fidelity and then Philip Rosedale's crew to craft a, a, a theatrical experience in VR that is starting to take advantage of some of these things that can be a really cool experience but would be totally impractical in the real world. And I just want more people thinking about this kind of stuff. There's not a lot of great VR design work right now. Um, probably my favorite person doing VR worlds right now is a guy by the name of Mike Murdoch. He was recently named the art director of VR Chat. And, uh, you know, I can't represent what his, what his experiences are like, but he is clearly, when you go into his worlds, thinking about what VR can do well. Um, his, some of his influences that he turned me on to that I really like, a guy by the name of Mobius Woods, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and uh, an artist by the name of Mobius, who are just always thinking about these um, architectural pieces, this architectural phenomena that couldn't exist in the real world, but as a VR experience, could be quite magical. 
Um, hey, we're in Venice, guys. Anyone here read this book? Show of hands. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, great. That makes me really happy. Uh, this was a book we were required to read before my first year of architecture school, and I loved it. And you think about it, there's all these imaginary cities in here, purely described, and you could create these in VR. And how magical would that be, especially if you're not necessarily going for photorealism. One thing I didn't mention about what I really like about sketches in VR is it still leaves something up to the imagination. You're not prescribing a wall thickness or a material type or certain kinds of lighting, and so that's not what people respond to when they're looking at a VR sketch. They're thinking about compression and release, and again, I'm going to keep using the word, phenomenological experiences of the space while still using their imagination to think about what it could be when it's finished. But then in VR, it could stay as a sketch that way. Maybe that's the best version of that space. And then, hey, uh, uh, these were all the books I was thinking about in terms of phenomenology. I don't know why my font went crazy. And then because uh, Keely mentioned Hidden Dimension, that's one I'm not familiar with, but I just had to add it to this list. Um, these are all different books that in some way or another are talking about um, ways that you can start to think about what makes a spatial experience inside architecture good. Some of them are very prescribed um, you know, by an architect saying, like, this is the only way to do it, and everyone else is idiots. Uh, but I think they all have different value for different ways. And so, you know, when you think about some of the quotes, especially from famous architects out there, talking about what they think makes good architecture, um, they're all talking about the built environment. They're all talking about what actually exists in the real world. But to me, almost all of these things can be talking about a virtual reality architecture experience that people can still be sharing in and can still be having a profound emotional impact on them um, being very well designed. And what's funny too is about some of these things, you know, some of these things aren't true anymore. Uh, Fred Lloyd Wright has that famous quote about saying the doctor can bury his mistakes, but an architect can only encourage his client to plant vines. Not true in VR anymore. Things can constantly be updated. Um, I like just the thought-provoking quality of, of Louis Kahn talking about, you know, what different materials want to be in the real world. And so because you're so much more open in virtual reality, you know, does a line of a certain color or a certain particle effect or a certain, you know, quality of any kind that might not exist in the real world, does that have something that it wants? So I don't have answers for anything here, but I think this is all very valid to ponder and think about, um, as I hope you all now go off and create wonderful virtual reality experiences. And then also, Frank Gehry, uh, love him or hate him, uh, has this little quote, which is just another reason to think about the potential value of virtual reality and architectural experiences. Um, a, a lot cheaper to build uh, a beautiful you know, piece of architecture in VR. And because a lot of people, I mean, I, I've worked in a lot of different spaces in a lot of different cities. And um, yeah, a lot of it is uh, the product of many, many compromises and designed by committee. That's the reality. Whereas in VR, you actually could have an entire office building, for lack of a better term, that is the singular vision of one person. And you know, if people don't like it, maybe someone who paid for it, you know, loses fifteen thousand dollars or something like that. So just the fact that these opportunities exist now, it's very exciting to me. I hope it's exciting to you. Come check out some demos. Uh, by the way, there is a little uh, civil web VR experience that's viewable on Piotr's The Viewer. Uh, he's about to talk next, so I figured it's a good lead into him. And uh, thanks very much for listening, guys. I'm happy to talk later. Goodbye.